All right, we are praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you this evening. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the strength, and we thank you for how far you brought us. You took us through our daily activities, and this evening we've gathered here to share and discuss about our lifestyle and the, the diseases that is associated with our lifestyle. We pray that you will see us through, we commit the resource person into your hands, use him to teach us so that at the end of the day, we shall learn something from here and we'll use it to better our life. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are yet to join, that you remind them that yes, a program is going on, therefore, whatever they are doing, they may also join us so that we all benefit for this all important meeting and discussion. This and many, we ask through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Um, the, I would like to welcome all of us to this evening's program. The program is a major one for welfare as part of our activities for the year, this session. We agreed that every second Friday of the month, we should be talking about our health so that at least we will be able to do things to prevent us from falling sick than rather trying to manage the illness that will be for us. So uh, we have gathered here this evening to deliberate on a topic, lifestyle and diseases. And this topic is going to be handled by an expert, an expert, sorry, uh, an expert in the fold of the diseases that actually attack people. And uh, if you don't take the time, it will end up in your grave. So we want to know much about it. And our resource person is Dr. Collins Kokru. He is a senior lecturer at the Department of Medicine of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He is a consultant, physician, and cardiologist at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital, Department of Internal Medicine, and the head of cardiology. He is an executive member of the Ghana chapter of the West African College of Physicians the deputy training coordinator in internal medicine for the West African College of Physicians, Ghana chapter, and the president of the Ghana Society of Cardiology. He is involved in community and volunteering work with special interest in community education of hypertension, obesity, and cardiovascular diseases in general. Dr. Kokru is married, married with three children. And uh, since we are all virtual, I think with one heart and spirit, let's welcome our resource person, Dr. Collins Kokru. Dr. Collins, we are ready for you and the platform is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tobia Franklin, and good evening to you all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, that you've given me, inviting me to share on the topic that we have for this evening, and that is lifestyle and disease. Uh, I would like to go into slide mode and then we can start. 
So, once again, thank you. I'm very grateful for, for, for the opportunity. And I thank the organizers for inviting me to this all important program. And indeed, any program that is intended to educate us on lifestyle is a very good program in that uh, it affords us the opportunity to be able to take care of ourselves and live longer. And when we live longer, we want to live a healthy life. We don't want to live a longer life that is full of uh, debilitating diseases. Yet as we grow, there are some disease conditions that we always have, but then we want to make sure that we live a lifestyle that is healthy. So this evening, the topic for discussion for us is lifestyle and diseases, lifestyle and diseases. So this is going to be my presentation outline. I'm going to talk about the changing lifestyle. I'm going to talk about changing lifestyle over the last century. I also talk about what lifestyle changes are associated with diseases. We'll look at specific examples of diseases that have basis in lifestyle. And then we'll look at what can be done to prevent these lifestyle diseases. So that is what we are going to be doing this evening. Now, what are diseases of lifestyle? When we say disease of lifestyle, we mean diseases that are caused partly by unhealthy behavior and partly by other factors. What it means is the behavior that we exhibit, the diseases that this behavior can lead us to is what we call disease of lifestyle. The disease of lifestyle are caused by a person's habits, a person's behavior, and a person's practices. So that means that where you live, where you move, where you go about the habits that you stay in can influence some diseases. The behavior that you exhibit uh, can also cause some diseases. And then the practices that you do, the things that you do, the practices can also cause uh, some diseases. And these diseases caused by habits, behavior, and practices are what we call diseases of lifestyle. So when you know the factors that contribute to lifestyle, then you can make lifestyle choices now to be able to reduce the chances of these diseases later in life. And I dare say that even if you already have these diseases, then you will be able to prevent your disease from getting worse or worsening over the years or being able to, you'll be able to manage the diseases such that it doesn't lead to a debilitating lifestyle. Now, there's been a change in transition. There's been a change in our lifestyle. We used to have the lifestyle that was full of activities several years ago, farming, even if we were doing things in the house, they were things that would let us have some activity. So we could have, uh, could have uh, activities in the house or at the job workplace that increases our lifestyle. Now we have transitioned. We have transitioned to a situation where this transition has led us to as being always busy, being on the move, always having a lot of things to do, things that lead us to sitting at one place for a very long time. And even if we are working, we walk in ways that still do affect our lifestyle. And this is not only for just our lifestyle. If you are to go into the history of surveying or surveying practices, 
there have also been some transition. So if you look at the picture that we have on your left hand of the screen, uh, I'm told that that is how the, the surveying land and doing your, your, your mappings and other things, that's how it was. Look at the roofs and look at the stone and the metals that we used to work with. Now, uh, we have simple tools that you do not have to be joining long ropes. Don't forget joining all the long ropes. You'll be working to join all those long ropes. So those have reduced. And what do we have now? We have things that make us even move less. That is not even the, the current situation. Currently, you could stand at one place and just with the help of uh, IT and drones be able to map and uh, survey a whole vast area in a very short time. And so all these have really affected the way that we do things. We have become less, we have become less active. We have become less active because of the lifestyle changes that we have now. So what are the changing lifestyles driven by? This changing lifestyle is driven by urbanization, globalization, tobacco use, and these days we have what we call shisha, etc. nutritional changes, and I dare say advances in technology. These have changed the lifestyle. So now, changing lifestyle is not bad in itself. There are many good aspects of it because it makes us more efficient in our way of living. It makes us more comfortable. It improves our economy. It brings money. There's wealth creation and so many. But then the disease aspect of it, the, the bad aspect of it is that it makes us do more office work we may be sitting at the desk for a very long time. We have remote control. We control all our gadgets. We do not have to walk to go and switch the television on or off or change channels. We use mobile phones. And I dare say that even in the same office, you may have somebody calling another person on the mobile phone to talk about something that the person could have walked easily to that person to talk about. So we've been very... Uh, uh, less mobile, even though we say mobile phones. We use computers to do all sorts of things. And we drive to work, drive home, drive to friends instead of walking. And when it comes to what we eat, there's been a lot of bad change. We eat out so often, we don't have to cook. Now it has become even old fashioned if you have to cook every day. So these lifestyles have many negative aspects. There've been alteration in our eating habit. It has led to less and less physical activities. And these have increased incidence of diseases that we call chronic non-communicable diseases, non-communicable disease or chronic disease. So the alteration in our eating habit and the fact that we are being less and less physically active leads to a lot of disease conditions that we call non-communicable diseases. There's a saying that you are what you eat, and we also say that you are as ill as your diet, because if your diet is bad, you are certainly going to get ill, and that will take you to the hospital, be it in a chronic state, or in an emergency situation. So the shape of things to come, yes, this is proposed to be where we have come from, from the trans, uh, transition to a lifestyle that was healthy, but now we are going into the obese world and we are having even young children becoming more obese. And so we are becoming less and less active. And if you look at the history of survey, then you will see that, yes, 
the shape of things to come has also affected survey uh, in the uh, old age or the stone age. Yes, survey was also there and people were using minor tools to do surveying and there was more physical activity, but now there is less physical activity, less working. So they have also been evolution in survey techniques. So what has happened? There have been what we call the dietary shift, the dietary shift. What has happened is now our diet has changed from the traditional whole grain or less refined food, uh, the diet that we ate that had low fat, low sugar, low animal products, high fiber and high foods have changed to more refined products, more refined products. There's high intake of oil, high intake of saturated fat, high intake of sugar, and high intake of salt. That is what has, is happening to us now. So it seems everybody is on the run. Everybody is on the run. Everybody is run and therefore, it has become like, get something quickly to eat and go. And what are we getting to eat? We are eating the things that are shaping the diseases that are, we are getting in our lifestyle. So we are eating the pizzas, the sausages, the trophies. And if you go to a meeting now, the meeting you will not find the usual things that we say are healthy. Everybody will be eating the pizzas and the fried rice, etc. Even if you are not, if you are just a bit lucky, that is when you may find some fruits and vegetables being served as dessert. Other than that, it is the usual ice cream, etc. So our diet has moved to less refined ones, which are not healthy for our lifestyle. Yes, these diets look very appealing, but they do not appeal to the heart. They do not appeal to the heart. They do not appeal to the brain. They do not appeal to the kidneys. They rather lead to damages of these organs in our body. So this has been what we are eating. What we are saying is these eating habits are not good for our lifestyle. So check, check has become now a tradition. And therefore, every corner that you pass, even in villages now, first it used to be in cities. Now in villages now, you see that there are check checks that everybody is going to check himself with. So these Western types of food, why are they not good for us? They have less complex carbohydrates. The complex carbohydrates are very good for us. They protect us from disease. But these Western type of foods have less complex carbohydrates. There's an increase in total fat, and they also lead to increased cholesterol. There is far more animal products in these Western type of food. And they are full of salt. And the salt is not only the salt that we use in the uh, house usually, but all the artificial salts that are in the market. So they end up predisposing us to non-communicable diseases or diseases that are not caused by infections. So with the Western type of food and a relatively sedentary lifestyle, it leads to an increased risk of obesity and increased risk of chronic diseases and diseases of lifestyle. When we say non-communicable diseases, what are we talking about? Non-communicable diseases simply are diseases that are not caused by infections, diseases that are not caused by infection, even though some non-communicable disease can have an initial uh, infection and it can lead to that. So it means that you cannot catch non-communicable disease just by touching somebody or staying in the same environment with an individual. An example of these non-communicable diseases are diabetes, hypertension, 
obesity, heart attacks and heart failure, strokes and cancers. So these non-communicable diseases directly fall into what we call diseases of lifestyle, disease of lifestyle. So these, with the exception of cancer, all these non-communicable diseases are termed cardiovascular disease. What it means is they are diseases that affect the heart, the brain, and the blood vessels that move or that uh, create cross uh, within our body. So cardiovascular diseases affect our heart and the blood vessels. Now, there are risk factors for these non-communicable diseases, including cardiovascular disease. And there are two main types. There are risk factors that you can control and there are risk factors that you can control. For risk factors that you can control, what it means is you can do something about them and revert risk factors. For risk factors that you cannot control, it means that there are static factors that continue to persist and therefore you cannot do anything about it. Let's look at some of these uncontrolled risk factors, uncontrolled or uncontrollable risk factors. Age, you cannot stop yourself from age. And the more, as you grow, you, are, you cannot stop yourself. Even though there are some, now some of the things that people talk about that, reduce aging, etc. It's not been shown that these medications will reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Gender, whether you are a male, you cannot change yourself to a female, and you cannot change yourself to a male. Even though we know that when we use the term sex, then now there are a whole lot of things that people will talk about sex and transgender. Now, men usually have, have more heart diseases and we know so we have when it comes to breast cancer, it's women that have breast cancer. Ethnicity, we cannot change the father with that. And we know that blacks have more blood pressure than the white colored people. And here it is, things that we inherit from our we cannot change this one. So these are called uncontrollable risk factors. Then we have the controllable risk factors or the risk factors that we can do something about. And these are the diet. And I've put diet on number one. Uh, when we talk about diet, we have good diet and bad diet. Improper diet leads to non-communicable diseases and therefore disease of lifestyle. And even in those who already have non-communicable uh, non diseases, improper diet leads to worsening of these non-communicable diseases. And it can also lead to an end death from these non-communicable diseases. Your body weight, you can do something about it. Sure that either you maintain your weight or you reduce your weight. Your daily level of physical activity you can do so much your mic. Your daily level of physical activity, and then you can change your smoking habit. If you smoke, we say that you need to stop smoking. And alcohol abuse or alcohol misuse is also something that we can change. So these are called controllable risk factors. And that's where we are going to be based this evening because these are the areas that we can modify. Now, what are the risk factors? Uh -huh. Number one on the list is hypertension. Hypertension. Hypertension is the main driver of cardiovascular disease worldwide and also in Ghana. We shall talk a bit detailed about it. Poor diet. Poor diet will lead to obesity. When we, uh, we take poor diet, we increase our body weight and our body gain, and that leads to obesity. Abnormal serum lipids, or what we normally will say, cholesterol levels go high with poor diet. 
And then when we take in high salt, that also affects us and increase our rates of getting this cardiovascular disease. Cigarette smoking, I've talked about that, diabetes mellitus and physical inactivity. Let's just quickly talk about diabetes mellitus. What is diabetes? Diabetes is a disorder where you are having abundance, but you are not able to use it and use it well when it comes to the body. What it means is there's a lot of sugar in the body or glucose in the body, but the body is not able to utilize this glucose very well. And so the body becomes saturated with glucose and the glucose levels go high. Diabetes increases the volume and frequency of urine, frequency of urine. And people who have diabetes may increase their water intake, they will increase their appetite. And usually uh, if the diabetes is not controlled, some people will lose weight. Diabetes kills if it is not treated. Diabetes is a risk factor for stroke. It is a risk factor for heart attack. It is a risk factor for kidney diseases. And in Ghana, we have found out that diabetes is a major cause of chronic kidney diseases. Chronic kidney disease. That is disease that affects your kidney and the kidney is not able to function well and that can lead to death. High body weight or obesity. Obesity is not a sign of affluence. It is actually a sign of ill health. Uh, until recently, uh, a lot of people thought that if you are fat, if you are fat, then it shows that you are eating well and you are actually living well. But we know that people with obesity, all things we will call, have a lot of risk factors that leads to early death. So it is not a sign of affluence. Hypertension. Hypertension five decades ago was said not to be a health problem in Ghana. Professor Pobi did a study in Accra around uh, Kantamanto and also around the areas around Kualibu. And then he concluded that hypertension is not a health problem in Ghana. But what do we have today? Hypertension is a major problem in Ghana, a major health problem. Now, hypertension is one of the most important killers in this country. If you come to our hospital, hypertension is killing more than the malaria that we know. And the risks that hypertension predisposes to, like the heart attacks and strokes, are the number one cause of death in our hospitals. So it is no longer the infections that are killing us. So we have what we call the double burden of disease. Whilst the infections are killing our children, hypertension is killing our adults. So if you look at some of the studies that we have done in Ghana, if you take those who are more than 40 years or 45 years, one in every three adults have hypertension. It means that if you have six people in a room, you are most likely to have two of them having hypertension. The incidence is increasing and even increasing as one grows. So it has become a major public health issue now. So a disease that was said not to be a health problem in Ghana is now become a major health problem in Ghana. So hypertension is simply a disorder that leads to consistently high blood pressure or BP, like we call it. So normally, if your systolic or the top blood read blood pressure reading is more than 140 and or the down blood pressure is more than 90 persistently, then we say you have hypertension. So it is important to take notes of that. If you look at this slide, I'm showing a newspaper publication in the Metro newspaper in London, and it captures the effect of salt on hypertension very well, because a lot of us do like salt, and there are people who even say that for me, 
If I don't add a little salt to the food, I cannot eat it. So you will go to a cemetery and then you look at the cause of death and the cause of death in that cemetery is salt, salt, salt. What it means is salt is a major killer or a major risk factor for hypertension. So it's important for us to note that. Is hypertension really a big deal? Yes, it is a big deal. When your blood pressure is high, your heart has to work extra hard to be able to pump blood to all parts of your body. And it's akin to when you go to the gym or when the young men go to the gym and they are lifting metals, what happens is as they do lift the metals, their shoulders become big and you see that the shoulders and the chest become broad and big. That is what happens when you have high blood pressure. The heart will have to do extra work to be able to pump blood through the body. And that leads to thickening of the heart walls. And thickening of the heart walls is a big danger because it leads to a point where the heart cannot relax well. And that can lead to heart failure and also become a risk for heart attack. So hypertension, if it is not treated, is a cause of a number of complications cause of a number of complications. It can lead to stroke and hypertension alone without any other risk factor can cause stroke. It's a cause of heart failure and heart attack. It's a cause of kidney uh, failure. It's a cause of eye problems and it can kill. It kills people in great numbers and it kills people in our, their prime. So until about 10, 15 years ago, if somebody were going to die from a complication of hypertension, then the person will be an elderly person, somebody about 50, 60. But what we see now is we are having people as young as 25, 30, 35, 40 being killed by hypertension. So it's important that we take note of that. Let me quickly stress on hypertension and stress, hypertension and stress. Stress in itself will lead to a temporary elevation of blood pressure, but we don't have strong evidence to support stress causing hypertension itself. But the danger is when you are stressed for a long time, that can lead to other disease conditions or other uh, problems that will lead or influence other risk factors for heart disease and therefore lead to cardiovascular disease. So for example, we know that when people are stressed, they eat unhealthy diet, they have poor nutrition, they tend to drink a lot. Some people will tend to smoke a lot. And all of these can play a role in the development of high blood pressure and heart disease. Now, what do we need to do to prevent cardiovascular disease? And I must say, diseases of lifestyle. There should be lifestyle modification for a healthier and more enjoyable life. How do we do that? We need to prevent cardiovascular disease. By that, we mean that we need to relax more. Yes, we are all on the move. We are all busy. We do not have time to relax. It is important that we know that relaxing prevent cardiovascular disease. We need to trim the fat, the meat, the fat portions that we eat, we need to trim it down. The fats and oils that we pour in our food, we need to begin to speak to the food that we eat, whether at home or at office. We need to begin to speak to that. We need to hold the salt. There is no benefit adding excess salt to your food. And we know that the excess salt rather will lead to you having cardiovascular disease. Keep your weight healthy. When we say keep your weight healthy, what it means is try not to be overweight. If you are overweight, try to come down to normal weight. If you are obese, try to come down to a bit of overweight and try to go to normal. However, if you keep yourself moving, if you do exercise and then even your weight is not coming down, you will still have some benefit 
in terms of your cardiovascular disease. If you smoke, quit smoking. If you smoke, quit smoking. And you should, if you drink alcohol, reduce the alcohol that you take. First, we used to say that reduce the alcohol to uh, two mini bottles for a man per day and one mini bottle for a woman per day. But now we know from World Health Organization that we need to reduce the alcohol till we stop drinking the alcohol. So that is something that we need to take. So keys to good life. What are the keys that can lead to good health? Good health. We need to take care of our nutrition and I've talked about it. We need to exercise. We always need to be on the move. We need to take advantage of every opportunity that will make us work, especially for us in our offices. We can walk to our secretaries, go and give them work, and then ask them to call us when the work is ready so that we go back for it, rather than always calling them and making them do the exercise while we sit at one point. We can use the staircase instead of the elevators we can park our car at distance and walk to our workplace. All these are forms of exercise. We should avoid addiction to smoking, alcohol, and drugs. We should protect ourselves from diseases. We should protect ourselves from disease. We have to make sure we get enough sleep and manage stress. So these are keys to good health generally. So what do we need, to, what needs to be done? So somebody goes to the doctor and then the doctor advises him about having a very good life. And then he tells the doctor that, doctor, don't blame it on lack of exercise or poor diet. I've got a weak heart. And this weak heart is because the girls have broken it since I was in junior high school. So don't wait and say that you have a weak heart and therefore you can exercise. You can do little exercise, even if you have a weak heart. So what are the dietary recommendations in practice? We say that eat a variety of food from all the food groups, the carbohydrate, the protein, the fats, the nutrients, the elements, etc. Increase consumption of fruits and vegetables. And here we do recommend that if it is possible, you can have five servings of fruits and vegetables. Reduce intake of total fat and saturated fat. What it means is you can boil a big food instead of frying them, reduce the frying of food. These days, there are gadgets because of IT that you can use to cook to reduce the fat portions of it. Trim all the visible fat from your meat before you use them and use very little oil where there is no need to use oil, avoid them and remove extra oil from the surfaces of food when they are visible. Reduce your salt intake and reduce consumption of simple carbohydrates like what we call the soft drinks. The soft drinks, we have to reduce them or completely avoid them. So this is a table that is giving us our dietary recommendation. So from the apex there, all the way to the base, the various food groups are there and we are supposed to select from these. So the bread, the wheat bread, the vegetables and fruits, the milk, and then also the oils need to be very small. So this is just a diagram that can help us always to remember the portions that we need to eat more and the portions that we need to eat less. Diet and diabetes and hypertension. When we have diabetes and hypertension, usually we do what we call drug treatment and non-drug treatment. For the drug treatment, we need to take our drug treatment regularly as recommended by our doctors. And we also need to check our blood pressure and blood sugar regularly so that when it is going up, we will be able to know contact our doctors or our health physicians before problems come. There are a lot of people who, even when they go to hospital and they are given six months for review, they may not check their blood pressure or blood sugar 
until the six months is due and they go to the hospital. Now, the recommendation that we give is at least once a week, if you have hypertension or diabetes, you need to check your blood pressure, you need to check your blood sugar, record the levels when you go to hospital, show these recorded levels to your doctor and have discussion with your doctor. Now, for the non-drug measures, they are very key and very important. And the number one that I always put on the, on, 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 the, on, on the bill is, do not miss your appointments. Don't let your busy schedule let you miss your appointments. They are as good as your life, and therefore you need to take them seriously. Weight reduction is one of the non-drug measures and very effective. There's a need to limit the sorts that we take. I've talked about that, I kind of emphasize, reduce alcohol consumption and increase your physical activity. And I must say that every little opportunity that you have to move, keep on moving. Increase your fruits and vegetable consumption and stop smoking if you smoke. There are evidence to show that these lifestyle modifications lead to significant and appreciable reduction in your blood pressure levels that are comparable to even some of the medications that we do take. So for instance, if you take weight reduction, weight reduction can lead to as much as 20 millimeters of mercury reduction in your systolic blood pressure. If you're able to lose 10 kilograms of weight, some of the drugs that we take are not even able to do up to 20 milligrams reduction in our systolic blood pressure or the top blood pressure. So it's very important. If we ad adapt a diet that is healthy, we are able to reduce our systolic blood pressure by as much as 14 millimeters of mercury. Your amlodipine five milligrams will reduce your systolic BP up to about 10 or 15. So let's take note of that. Dietary salt reduction, eight millimeters of mercury. If you are physically active, doing physical activity for most days of the week, you're able to reduce your systolic BP up to about nine millimeters of mercury. And if you reduce alcohol or take more, only moderate alcohol, you're able to reduce your systolic BP. So it means there's evidence to show that indeed these lifestyle modifications have positive effect on our lifestyle by reducing our blood pressure and also our blood sugar. It is important that we exercise every, every, most days of the week and the recommendation is 30 minutes of brisk walking per day. And let me say that if you cannot do the 30 minutes in the morning, you could divide it, do 10 minutes in the morning, in the afternoon you can walk about, and in the evening you can add 10 or 15 minutes to target about 30 minutes in a day all together. So it is important. Or you can do 20 minutes of jogging or running for most days of the week. This helps to reduce your cardiovascular risk and by extension, disease of lifestyle. And even if you have this disease of lifestyle, it helps to reduce it or prevent complications from setting in. So it is important that we look at our schedule and look at what fits our schedule better. Is it exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? When we die, we do not have to exercise, but then we would have been gone and therefore we would have been useless human beings from now. So it is important that we look at what fits us better. It shouldn't always be our busy schedules. Healthy eating, reducing salt intake, increasing fruits and vegetables. I can't overemphasize low fat diet. These are healthy eating and we need to practice them. And we need to be physically active for most days of the week. And I've said that the physically active is not only going to run, moving about, walking from table to table, moving, packing your car and walking to the office, uh, going to your secretary to give work and also going to collect their work back rather than the secretary bringing it to you. All these are forms of 
exercise of physical activity. Some authorities even say that as you sit, if you tap your feet, you keep on tapping your feet, that is a form of physical activity. So we say men don't die, they kill themselves. Why do we say that? It is the things that we do as men that kills us. I want to thank you very much for your for listening to me. Thank you. Ah, what a, what a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Collins. Uh, I wish we were having this physically for us to give you a standing ovation for this wonderful presentation that you've done for us. I am very much touched and I've gotten my part. We thank you so much for uh, honoring this, our invitation and coming to give us this uh, uh, food for thought, big lessons for all of us. I know surveyors are busy men all the time going up and down. And uh, I think uh, this topic actually is a good one for us. Thank you very much. And uh, we, 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 we appreciate the time and what you have given us. Colleagues, seniors, it's time for Q&A. If you have any question, please just uh, indicate by your hand and uh, we will call you to ask your question. Or you can place a question in the chat and uh, we can read it for you. Thank you. We have 10 minutes to do this. And at the end of the day, we will call it a day. Questions? Okay, so there is a question in the chat box. If I My can read it and then start with it. Okay. Somebody to talk. Right. So somebody say, please, can you kindly clarify if there is a good or bad cholesterol? How do we accumulate this? And then the second question is, if my blood pressure goes above the limit once in a while, is that a cause for concern? Thank you very much, Sylvia uh, Ato, for a very good question that you have asked. Yes. So yes, we have good cholesterol and we have bad cholesterol. The good cholesterol is one of the things that the body used to protect us. And the bad cholesterol, of course, we in medicine, we say it is atherogenic. So it leads to diseases that affect our blood vessels and our heart, and that can lead to death. Yes, the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol are in our body. Normally, we want the good cholesterol to go up to protect us and also to help us fight disease and the bad cholesterol, we want it to go down. The lifestyle changes that we talked about, these lifestyle changes like the high salt diet, the high fat diet, diet the less uh, refined diet, the more refined diet, these lead to high levels of the bad cholesterol and low levels of the good cholesterol. The bad cholesterol is called high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. And the good cholesterol is called high density lipoprotein or HDL cholesterol. So these lifestyle changes that we talk about, this lifestyle can lead to high levels of the bad cholesterol and low levels of the good cholesterol and therefore affect us negatively. The second question, if your BP goes above the, the limit set by, and let me say that the limit should be set by you and your doctor, not just you alone, you and your doctor, looking at other risk factors that you have. If it goes above the limit once a while, it shouldn't ideally go above the limit. Of course, if we are stressed out, it can go above some limit. But on the whole, the average reading for a day or the average reading of your record should be less than the, uh, the limit 
that have been set by your doctor. A number of things can let the blood pressure go up momentarily, like when, when, when you are stressed, uh, when you don't have good sleep, etc. But this shouldn't be a constant thing. So if it goes up above the limit a number of times or more often, it is a big cause for concern. It leads to something that we call blood pressure variation, which is not good for our body. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one hand up before we come to other questions in the chat. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Lamte, or mute and yes. Uh, yeah, doc. Doc, thank you very much. Thank With you. regard to the the hypertensions, uh, one may get ninety over sixty five for the past ten years. Please, what can you say about it? Ninety over sixty five. Okay. Thank you very much. For the past 10, 20 years. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yes, there are some people, there are some people who have blood pressure readings that are in the low side or that are on the low side. But we say that if your blood pressure is low and it doesn't lead to you fainting or you having dizziness all the time, or you fall in, then it is better than it being uh, high. So we used to have something that we call low blood pressure, but now we don't talk about it any longer. The reason is the low blood pressure is when the blood pressure is low, such like that it affects your activity. It makes you feel dizzy or it makes you feel, uh, it makes you collapse, etc. If the blood pressure is 90, 60, and it is not making you collapse, it is not making you feel dizzy, then it is better for you. And what it means is you are going to live longer than your peers of the same age whose blood pressure are higher than you. So if it is not causing this dizziness, it's not causing collapse, it's not making you feel sweaty and feeling uh, uh, what we call giddy, then it is good. Thank you. Yeah, we have two. Thank you very much. We have two questions in the chat. One is, dog. By how much should we cut salt? Because almost every food has salt. We don't cook it ourselves. And the other one is, are there any recommendations for health devices or monitors that we should always have in our household? Thank you very much. The first one is how much salt should we touch? Should we cut? Ideally, ideally, if we were able to measure, then we want to take less than or equal to five grams of salt a day for every individual. Five. Now, it is not possible, like you said. Because the food that we are buying, we don't know how much salt in, is in it. So the advice is whatever salt that we are using, we need to cut it down. If the food tastes more salty, we should avoid them. And then we shouldn't add on salt at table. If we have to cook the food ourselves, we should try as much as possible to reduce the salt that is put in. Uh, most of us may not know that even the plantain, the cocoa yam, the cassava, the garden eggs that we eat already have some salt in them. So if you are using this and you add on more salt, then you are increasing your salt intake. So whatever means that you can to cut salt, please cut them and avoid those artificial salts which have more monosodium glutamate, which are not healthy for our body. The second question was, can you repeat it for me? Yes, yeah, said, are there any recommendations for health devices or monitors that we should always have in our household? Yes, there, there are general recommendations for blood pressure monitoring devices or what we call the SFIC. Every household should have some. Uh, we now talk about what we call home blood pressure monitoring. So for even people who have high blood pressure, 
We want people to check their blood pressure at home because that is your home environment. And then you bring your readings to the hospital. So if it, you can afford, indeed, it is good to have your blood pressure checked at home. And it's good to have your own blood pressure monitor. You can have one for your family at home. And let me sound this here. Your, our children who are in their teens, it is also important that we check their blood pressure once a while. Some of them may develop hypertension at a very early age, and we may ignore that and not know. For those who have diabetes, we recommend that if it is possible, you have your own blood glucose monitoring device or the glucometer so that you can check it often and be able to record it and show it to your doctor. So these devices, uh, as for blood pressure, whether you have the blood pressure monitoring device, whether you have hypertension or not, it is important to have it in your home so that once in a while you can check your blood pressure. But if you don't have diabetes, you may not keep the glucometer. However, if you have diabetes and if you can afford, it is important to keep the glucometer with you so you can monitor your blood glucose level regularly. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, two more. No, one is um, sorry. Um, you talk of the weight. Uh, once you check about your weight and you should be within the normal weight range. I don't know. What is the value for your weight to be considered a normal? Okay. Thank you very much for that question. It's a very important question. Now, because we have different body habitus, there are weight uh, adjustments that are considered normal for every individual, depending on your height. And this has been translated into what we call body mass index, body mass index. The body mass index is simply the weight over your height square. And your weight should be in kilograms and your height should be in meters. Now, for the body mass index, when your body mass index is between 18 and 24, it is considered as normal. It is considered as normal. When it is 24 to 29, then it is considered as overweight, overweight. It means that it is not so high, but it is also not good, overweight. When it is between 30 and 35, then we say you are obese, you are obese. And when it is more than 35 or 36 and above, then we say that you are morbidly obese. So uh, overweight, obese, and morbid obesity are not good. So you can use this, your weight over your high square. And most of the smartwatches, you can easily put in your weight, put in your height, and then it will calculate your body mass in this for you and also tells you whether it is good or bad. Apart from that, there's what we call waist circumference, waist circumference. And for the waist circumference, we say that for men, if we measure the biggest part from your umbilicus all the way to your waist, if we measure the biggest part, for men, it should be less than or equal to 104. And for women, it should be less than or equal to 88. So this can also give you an idea for you to know whether your weight is too much or your weight is okay. And then you can work on it. But whatever your weight is, it is important to keep physically active. It is important to keep physically active. And I said that even if you are keeping physically active, that's if you are doing exercise most days of the week and your weight is not even coming down, you have more benefit than if you were not doing any physical activity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Last you very much. In the chat, they say, please, how often should we check our weight? And the other one is, please, if someone has BP of 150 over 100 for about five years, what is the implication? 
Thank you very much. For our weight, ideally, if we can, every it depends on our, our body habits, but then we can check it at least every month and record it and know whether our weight is going up or going down. Occasionally, we may have some fluctuations where it goes up a bit or comes down a bit. That's not so bad. But if it is going up and increasingly going up, then we need to check what is causing that and be able to manage it. So we can be checking our weight maybe once every month. If we have a very stable diet and a very stable lifestyle, then we could do it every three months. When your blood pressure is 150-100, it is not good. What it means is you have what we call stage one hypertension. If you're already hypertensive and your blood pressure keeps on at 150-100, it is not good. What it means is your blood pressure is not being controlled. And if your blood pressure is not being controlled, then your risk of heart attack, stroke, kidney disease goes on the high side. And that is not good for the body. So 150-100, it is not good. Either your medication needs to be looked at so that you take it well, or you may require more medication that you are already on or you may need to do more lifestyle. I showed you how the lifestyle is able to reduce the blood pressure. So for instance, if your blood pressure is 150, 100, and you are able to do exercise for most days of the week, then if you are able to reduce your weight by up to 10 kilograms, you'll be able to reduce your systolic blood pressure by 20, and that will bring you to what? 130 and not the 150 any longer. Thank you very much. Yeah, please, the question is, uh, how often should we check our BP? Not the weight, BP. Okay, good. So for our BP or blood pressure, if you are already hypertensive, then at least once a week, if the blood pressure is controlled, at least once a week, that is good for you. If the blood pressure is not controlled, then you may check it for about three times in a week. There are times we even instruct some patients to check it morning and evening and record it, depending on the blood pressure levels. Now, if you are not hypertensive, then at least once a month, you could check your blood pressure because blood pressure is, when your blood pressure is going up, you may not have any symptom. You may not feel anything. The only thing that you know is you check your blood pressure and it's high. And if you are not fortunate, the blood pressure may go up like that. It can lead to a stroke or a heart attack or even a kidney failure before you yourself, you know that your blood pressure is high. So it is important that you check your blood pressure at least once every month if you do not have hypertension. And then we say that every opportunity that you have to check the blood pressure, so probably there's a screening at work or there's a screening at church or you go home, you are sitting in your library and your mind comes onto your space, check it as often as you can so that if it is going up, you will be able to notice it and inform your doctors so that the appropriate thing can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat. And uh, Uncle Bright, uh, I yes, think yes, sir. Mute and uh, ask your question. We okay, would like thank you very take, much. Excuse me, we would like to take, if possible, two more questions or maybe some few ones in the chat. Then we'll, break, we'll draw curtains to the end of the program. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, for this opportunity. And doctor, thank you for an insightful presentation. But I just wanted to find out what causes, um, now there is what we mean by sciatica. I wanted to find out what causes that, because it looks as if uh, it's very dangerous to me as a uh, human. Um, I have some colleagues who are having some kind of challenge like that. So I wanted to find out what causes that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So the, the term sciatica, the term sciatica has come to stay with us. There are so many 
interpretations as to what constitutes sciatica. There's a nerve, there's a big nerve that comes from our spinal cord at the lower part where our hip is. And it's called a sciatic nerve, sciatic nerve. So it's one of the nerves that come from our lower back and goes onto our leg. That is the sciatic nerve. When you have anything affecting this nerve, it could be compression of the nerve or it could be damage to the nerve. That is what is called sciatica. But these days, what is happening? When people have waist pains, when people have leg pain, anything. Some people are even say they are called sciatica center. And anything that is affecting the waist or leg, then it's say sciatica. So in medical terms, sciatica is anything that is affecting the sciatic nerve. It could be compression from the back. It could be some mass or... Some the Uncle, Uncle Jeffrey, please unmute and yourself. That will lead to either a damage or compression of that leg. That is sciatica. Uh, so what I'm trying to say, some of the so-called things that are called sciatica, they are not sciatica. And at times, if you go to hospital and you are investigated, some of these things can be managed and then you'll be free. So it is important that before you classify yourself as having sciatica, you see a doctor, there's a group of doctors that are called orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons. They will evaluate you. And if indeed it's a sciatica, they will give you treatment. There are times that if it's indeed sciatica, you may require some surgery to be able to manage them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think this will be the last two questions that we will take then we draw curtains. Uh, on the program. Um, Doug, please, can you kindly give us some basic first aid procedure in managing some of these diseases in case of an emergency? And the second one is, is there anything like bad exercise or too much exercise for the heart, especially for the younger ones? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So let me start from the bad exercise. The bad exercise. We, we normally will want to encourage everybody to exercise. But then there are some people that will want to exercise immediately to cause change in them. So they may start from day one and they will strain their body so much, putting so much pressure on themselves such that they even begin to have so much body pain, they are not able to walk, they have pains in their legs, etc. This can be classified as bad exercise. So for every exercise, it is important that you start it gradually and build it up. So for instance, if you want to do, let's say jogging, you can start with day one, you can walk for day one, you can just do walking for up to about 15 minutes, return day two walk, and then day three, you begin to do some small jogging for about 10, 15 minutes. And then once your body has adjusted to this exercise, then you want to continue and you can increase the pace as you go up. But if you start from day one, some people will stand on the treadmill day one, go 30 minutes, one hour, and then the next day they cannot even move at all that can lead to some muscle problems and muscle tear, and that may even discourage you from going on with the exercise. The general advice in, is that preventing the lifestyle disease, isn't it? The first question. Yeah, the first question is, can you kindly give us some basic first aid procedure First aid, okay. First yes, in managing some of the diseases in case of any emergency. So uh, usually, usually the disease of lifestyle, they, they do not happen suddenly. They take time to build up. And that is the reason why we need to look for them before they do result in an emergency. However, supposing your blood pressure is so high and that leads to an emergency, 
some of the things that we call hypertensive emergency stroke, heart attack, uh, heart failure. In fact, in most cases, it is important to report to the hospital immediately, or it is important that you are taken to the hospital immediately. That is because there are some of these complications that require that the blood pressure is brought down rapidly. There are also some of them, like when you have a type of stroke that we call him uh, ischemic stroke, that bringing the blood pressure down rapidly can cause problems for you. So when there is an emergency, you need to calm down and make sure that you are taken to the hospital as quickly as possible because the management will depend on, on what is happening. So for instance, if you have your blood sugar going up and very high and leading to what we call ketoacidosis, if you are able to swallow fine, you could take your diabetic medication. But we know that when you take your diabetic medication, when it is so high, it may not work. You may require things like insulin and also fluids to be able to bring it down. So that is what I can say that when there is an emergency, if you have a stroke, the management depends on the type of stroke that you have had, whether it is what we call a ischemic stroke. That's where a small blockage has occurred somewhere in the brain or a vessel has burst and then the blood is has oozed out into the brain. The management differs. So it is not like, just put something under your tongue or some people will say, uh, just swallow your medicine or uh, I've heard people talk about the fact that when you have a stroke, you need to uh, uh, do a valsalva and all that. They are not strong evidence or they are not evidence to back some of these things that are said. And these days on social media, there are so many things. Somebody put on social media that, when you have a heart attack, put uh, big blows on your chest. Let somebody hit your chest so much. We've had a situation that somebody has had a chest blow that had led to a rib being breaking. So please, let us report to the hospital as quickly as possible when we have an emergency situation resulting out of this lifestyle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doc. We have some few questions, but as I said earlier, I think health issues are very important to everyone. And uh, the way I'm seeing the questions, <laughs> I am tempted to uh, maybe bend my rule a bit. This is the last two questions, dog, I beg you, that we will take. Please, members, don't tempt me to be bending my rules, accepting that. After these last two questions, we are drawing down the curtains on the program. So don't put in any questions again and don't raise hands again. We'll have another chance. Next, uh, first, first, no, second Friday next month, we'll also bring doctor in to continue with the preventive measures for our health. So doc, I beg you, kindly permit me to just allow my senior colleague, Sylvia Prosper Nutako, to ask this question. Then, uh, one in the chat, then we close. Okay. Sylvia Prosper. Sylvia Prosper. Hello. Okay, ask your question, please. Yeah, Doc, uh, what would be your take on the um, a situation where exercises in the morning is supposed to make you active, but when you have your brisk walk in the morning, you rather feel weak and uh, uh, down for some time. What would be your take on that? What are, the, what are the possible causes and what should the person be doing? Okay, thank you very much. For that question, uh, it is it is it is one of the common things that people do experience, and often you hear people tell you that when they do exercise, especially in the morning, they feel weak, 
and then they are not even able to go on. Or some will tell you that they will have to stay for a long time before they are able to do any other thing. There are a number of factors that can cause this. The first is probably, probably the person may be exerting himself too much. There is something that we call exercise capacity. Exercise capacity. And by exercise capacity, what it means is everybody has a level of exercise that he can tolerate depending on your health status and also even your age and other disease conditions. So whereas somebody can exercise vigorously for one hour and feel okay, another person exercising vigorously for one hour may break down. So it is important that we are able to identify our exercise capacity. There are some people too who have other disease conditions that affect them when they exercise. So for instance, if you have a heart failure, and a lot of people have what we call heart failure and they do not know. Heart failure simply means that the heart is not able to pump well to meet the body's demand for oxygen and also, let's say, the blood flow. Now, if you have some mild heart failure, you may go about your activity and be able to do everything. But when you do exercise, then the body's demand goes up and therefore you can get tired. There are some people who also have what we call exercise-induced asthma. Some people will even have what we call exercise-induced bronchospasm. So when they do exercise, their airway becomes narrow, and therefore they are not able to breathe in very well, especially if they stress themselves so much. All these can lead to one becoming weak. And there are some people too that they have some muscle problems or muscle problems as a result of maybe some chronic disease, even diabetes can lead to what we call a uh, musculopathy or disease that make the muscle weak. And therefore, when they do exercise, especially beyond certain limit, then their muscles become weak and they will have to stay for some time before the muscle relax and they will go. And on and on and on. So there are so many things that can affect that, but the common ones are the ones that have sick. I've mentioned. So if you do feel that whenever you exercise, you feel weak, you feel exhausted, it's like that you can't do anything for a while. It is important to report to your doctors. We will evaluate you. There are times we will even put you, if you can exercise, we put you on a treadmill in the hospital and look at what is happening and be able to help and manage you as necessary. Thank you very much. Uh, for some reason, I can't hear you, uh, so they are frankly. I still cannot hear. I don't know whether you are muted. You sorry. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Say, dog, please, is it good to take fruits or vegetables only as meal? If yes, when in the day is it advised? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, you can take fruits and or vegetables as a meal because it's, 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 it's a food nutrient. It's one of the food classes that helps the body. And actually when you take vegetables, you have carbohydrates in them, most of them, you have some having proteins, you have some minerals in there, you have some vitamins also in there. And in addition to that, you have a lot of raw fish and other nutrients that protect the body. So you can do that. The only thing is fruits and vegetables, these days have become very expensive, like we know. However, if you can, for instance, you can, may want to miss, you may want to change your dinner to fruits and vegetables if you have. You may want to change your lunch to fruits and vegetables. And these help the body a lot. It helps the body a lot. Even if you are not able to do that every day, once a while, 
you can change one of your meal and make it just pure fruits and vegetable. And it leads to a very healthy lifestyle and it also protects the body. So it is a very good thing to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is where we will draw down the curtains on this program. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Collins Koklu very much for making time to give us this wonderful presentation. I actually appreciate it. And I believe all members over here do also appreciate what we've all learned today. We are grateful to you, Doug, and uh, we, we, we are hopeful that any time that we call on you to come and do us the honors again, you will gladly accept our invitation. Thank you very much for making time to come. And uh, I would also like to thank members for also making time to be here to at least uh, learn something about our lifestyle. I know surveyors, I'm also a surveyor, and I know the way we do our things. All the time we are on the run trying to satisfy the, the, the customer or our clients just because uh, we are there for them. We don't want the client to say that we don't meet their time and others. So we are always on the run and lifestyle is actually what is worrying us because most of us will enter the bush without eating because you don't get anything to eat over there. Or because we are busy, we don't even have time to rest or to take meals at regular intervals. So I think this topic has uh, lightened us and we will by all means uh, stick to what the doctor has said. And I'm very sure it will go a long way to improve upon our life. Thank you very much, Doug, and thank you very much for uh, thank you very thank much, you everybody, for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have shared this with you, and I'm available every time if we are reached. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, announcements, uh, some few announcements for colleagues. Um, I think uh, we, our seminar is also coming on. Uh, this from 16th September, sorry, August to 19th August. The registration is ongoing. We encourage members to actually uh, uh, register because uh, the numbers that we see will help us to plan for the seminar very well. And the seminar is taking place in Tamale. We're using this opportunity. Those of us who have not been to Tamale, we also want to use this opportunity to go and know the place. So we should all do well to uh, register and be part of this uh, seminar. Again, we want to let members know that our yearly uh, health screening is also coming on around that same time in Tamale during the seminar. The health screening uh, 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 experts will be there to actually uh, screen us so that they will tell us our status, our health status, and the uh, the way forward. So we encourage everybody to come. And uh, this is also coming to stay that every second Friday of the month, we'll have this health talk so that we all learn things about our health. That is the order of the day. If you know, you'll be able to prevent uh, occurrence. So we think that we want to use uh, this uh, opportunity to learn more and help us prevent uh, uh, diseases so that we will be always strong in doing our work. On that note, I think we'll end here again with a prayer and we hope that next time when we call on you, you all come. So let me say the prayer again. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you very much for how far you brought us. Thank you for insightful knowledge that you've given us. We thank you for the knowledge you've endowed our resource person to deliver to us. We are grateful and we believe that what we've learned over here will help us to put it in practice. So we shall stay stronger and work better for our nation. And uh, we pray that you continue to keep us strong. And when we sleep and we wake up, we will not forget to give glory to you as you always give us life and we continue to lead for life. Thank you very much.